Hi guys, my name is Cynthia. Thank you for clicking on this video. Please like and subscribe. Okay, so this week is going to start with a mini video for us to have. Um, it's in regards to a serial killer named Tony Abel. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about the case and about his victims. And then at the end, I'm going to give you uh, pointers on how to identify and, you know, see the red flags. Because they're, they're there. It's just people just, they're either choosing not to see it or they, they just simply think, as most people think, it can't happen to me. That happens to other people, but it can't happen to me. Okay? So let's get started. Tony Abels, he was born and raised in the state of Florida. Uh, his first victim uh, happened while in a robbery. He killed him in 1970. Uh, three months later, he pled guilty to murdering him. The judge at the time sentenced him to life in prison. However, I don't understand why he after serving only 12 years of his sentence, he was released. I don't know. Good behavior? I don't know. However, that same year, he went to killed again. So, big mistake on whoever decided it was okay to let him free. So, that same year that he was released from prison on June 25th, 1983, he went ahead and killed an elderly, an elderly lady named Adeline McLaughlin. She was 84 years and she was found murdered in her home. Okay? She had been sexually assaulted and smothered with a pillow of her own. Not only was he not finished at that point with her, he then continued and robbed her. When her neighbors found her, they were just flabbergasted. They didn't understand why would anyone do such a thing. She was an elderly lady who lived by herself. She was very nice. She was very sweet. She never got into arguments with her. No one was out to get her and overall they would say that she kept to herself and was sweet just very sweet and nice and polite to everyone so they couldn't understand who and why would anyone do this so because of this he was not connected to her murder until 20 years later okay um it's very important to mention right now that his second and third victim were not connected to her until 20 years later okay so on to his third victim. His third victim was actually a girlfriend of his named Deborah Kisser. She was 31 years at the time of her murder. And this happened in 1987, only a few years later. Mm -hmm. She had been sexually assaulted and Abel's also strangled her. What he did later was he took his partially nude body to a nearby park where she lived, named Roser Park, and dumped her body like it was nothing, like it was a rag, like it had not meant absolutely nothing that he was involved with her romantically. Uh, a lot of people might be like, oh, well, you know, people don't have to be together like romantically they can just have you know sex and that's it call it a day which I understand but nonetheless you don't go ahead and kill that person and dump their body by a park it's like nothing it's just like an object and then you also you don't kill people um but the, that's a, a whole different subject. Uh, there's a lot of gray area there. Um, and after all these cases that I covered, trust me, you're like, is it okay to kill people? 
is it not okay to kill some people? Because some of these cases will just leave you like... <sighs> but anyway, those are other cases, okay? When we get to them, you'll understand why. So the fourth victim was also a girlfriend of his. This happened two years later. Um, his girlfriend's name was Marlene Burns. This murder happened on Grove Street, St. Petersburg in Florida, obviously. Um, as per their neighbors, they had been arguing and drinking all day. Mm -hmm. I don't know about other people, but if I hear my neighbors arguing and fighting, if I can hear you, trust me that I'm gonna go knock on that door or call the police and just, you know, express my concern. Like, is everything okay? What's going on? Do you need any any help? Any medical attention? I don't know. Anything. But the bystander effect is so big that things like this happen. You hear an argument, you hear that it's been going all day and it doesn't seem to dial it, that they're dialing it down, they just keep going at it and at it and at it. But because the bystander effect, what you do is that you just ignore it and think that someone else is going to take care of it. Someone else is going to call 911 or someone else is going to go up to their house and see if they're okay, if they need any help. That is the bystander effect and that's what happened. So the neighbors, no one decided to call anyone, no one decided to go and ask them if they were okay. But what ended up happening is that uh, stormed out of her apartment. It's not very clear where, but in the case, he went after her and found her in another apartment within their complex where they were living, oh, everyone was living at. Not their private uh, complex, but the complex where they were living at. Um, and what he did was he threw her down the stairs. And at that point, you could be like, oh my God, what did I just do? But no, uncontrolled anger, uncontrolled rage. He went down the stairs and began to kick her, beat her, and stomp her. He was so aggressive that the autopsy would later show that she had 27 fractures. In her ribs alone, she had 27 fractures. It's not counting any other um, bruise or any other bones broken throughout her body, but in her ribs alone, there were 27 fractures. That's a lot. Especially if you were living with that person if you were romantically in a relationship with that person so he just went on to full overkill full overkill you can also say that this was a crime of passion because if it's an accident or if it's you know something spontaneous that just i don't know and you're just real and you just snap you don't go into overkill. Meaning the person's already on the floor, the person's already, they can't move, they can't defend, defend themselves anymore. And you just decide that you're just going to continue to beat, kick, and stomp them because you just need to get all that anger out until you get physically tired that you cannot continue anymore. So at the same time, you can also say that this was a crime of passion because you full overkill tends to be something that this was just something that he had a, a personal issue like deep with her but that's just what I think after this he was charged with her death right away on June 6 uh, something that I'm gonna mention that not a lot of people know the jury not only can they dictate whether someone is innocent or guilty, they can also decide on on a punishment. They can decide 
what's the best punishment. They can recommend it to the judge, but the judge ultimately has the last word on that. So in this case, the jury recommended that he put he be put on the death penalty. Um, but the judge overruled that and decided, um, you know, no, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to sentence him to life in prison. And this is like for sure he's not getting out anytime soon. The reason why the judge said that he was going to give this verdict was because he said Abel's was mentally ill and because of other factors, he was not going to put him to the death penalty. The punishment simply didn't fit him because of that, because of those factors, because he was mentally ill. Throughout his trial, his brother did come up to the stand and say, yeah, you know, yes, we did have a very bad upbringing. Yes, um, our father would beat us, kick us, just be very verbally abusive, not only to us, but also to their mother. So growing up, it was just a very toxic and very dark environment. And also, they never they were never taught how to control their anger they would they they just knew violence and violence and violence and that's it also you also have to consider that when you get hit so many times and so often and it's just a constant thing in your life you don't know if the father might have triggered a, a brain injury that might have just uncontrollably made him so angry and aggressive towards other people or he was just naturally born that way this is something that we don't know but this is you can really go ahead and spark a debate of nature versus nurture but you know that that's I'll leave those those uh, that debate for the comments on whether whether you think that this is a natural thing that he was just born anger with anger problems or he just grew up to have these anger problems develop into him and have this violent way of him of dealing with problems in general okay so, in regards to his second and third victim, like I said before, he was not connected to these murders until 20 years later via DNA evidence. So, the way it works is whenever someone is put into jail, their fingerprints are put into a system where all the police from every state can have access to and they also upload their DNA. So whenever uh, the police or a detective, they're automatically, whenever they have a case on their hands and they don't know who, who the potential murderer is, um, automatically they'll also upload um, any DNA evidence found at the crime. And when they get a hit, an inmate, they automatically connect that the, the, the case and they start putting the pieces together and voila, DNA saves the day. So this is what happened. Um, so 20 years later, after his second and third victim, he was finally connected, thank you to DNA evidence and this system that was created. Um, he was officially charged for um, the elderly uh, woman in the case, his second victim, um, Adeline McCollin, on March 16, 2011. Um, however, um, prosecutors didn't go ahead and charge, uh, pursue any charges against him. I'm guessing it's because he's already in prison. He already has a death penalty. He's not going to get out anytime soon. Um, but what they said is that he is detained in her name. In regards to his third victim, Deborah Kisser, 
the prosecutor said that it was just too complicated to pursue. Reason being is because because they had been romantically involved, that DNA evidence alone was not enough to pursue and charge him for the case. But he is still in prison. Now, I mean, there's fingerprint evidence, but then you can argue that, you know, because they had been romantically involved, naturally her, his fingerprints would be on her clothing and his DNA would naturally be on her clothing or on her, or on her, uh, on her body or, you know, whatever the case may be, however they found the DNA. But regardless, they should have prosecuted. But I think the reason why they didn't prosecute was because she was living in a facility for people with mental illness and that was the reason or the primary reason why the prosecutors got lazy and decided you know what this guy's already in jail she was a uh, mentally in to begin with we're just not gonna prosecute the case he's gonna he's gonna be in prison for life anyway we got lazy at the same time I understand he's already in prison but you know, do your jobs. You know, she deserves justice. Her family, you know, there's very little information in regards to her family or any of the, the, the family of any of the victims, but I'm pretty sure if she had family, they would want, they would just want that as like a closing chapter for him to be charged officially with her murder but prosecutors were yeah it's too complicated okay so those were his four victims um and it's just a case full with anger completely out of control um he was raised in an environment where his father was very aggressive very violent however is that an excuse to then grow up and take four innocent lives no can that contribute to being chemically mentally chemically unstable possibly imagine him getting hit over the head very violently every day constantly it could it could trigger physically something in your brain that says violence is the only thing we know the only thing we're gonna keep going with and that's the only way to survive and to handle situations okay but we don't know and maybe we will never know but uh, nonetheless I want to go into the red flags uh, whenever you are in a, in, a, in a relationship, no matter what happens, no matter whatever the case may be, no one should ever put a hand on you. Ever. This applies to both men and women because this happens both ways. Woman onto men, man onto woman, it happens both ways. So, whenever you're in a relationship where someone tries to hit you, go ahead and just leave that relationship because it's not worth it. Also, whenever you're outside and you uh, are online to do your shopping or whatever the case may be, if someone go ahead and, and they wanna try to argue with you, you don't know what they have on themselves, you don't know if they take any type of medication, and the best thing you can do is just walk away from that situation. Just like in a relationship, relationship, just walk away. It's not worth it. Leave it alone. There are professionals that can help these people and they get paid a lot of money. You are not gonna change them. You are not gonna be, you yourself won't be enough to help them, okay? So, do yourself a favor, walk away from any type of arguments, especially nowadays with this coronavirus. Just stay safe, okay? So that's the video for today. 
um, please like and subscribe. Um, I will be uploading videos every Sunday and I'll alternate between serial killers and um, possible uh, supernatural cases which do happen and for all intents and purposes in, in this video, in this channel, what I want to do is open your eyes to things that are happening that do happen all around us but by some reason we just think these things won't happen to me, these things don't happen to my family or loved ones, okay? So I just want to open your eyes to situations that are happening around us and so we can identify the red flags, okay? Like and subscribe and I'll see you next Sunday. Bye.